So Thomas Merton and the education of the whole person is a broad topic. So this will be somewhat of an introduction. And it will also be not simply about education as schooling, not simply about our formal education, but education uh, thought more broadly. So really education and its ultimate purpose. By way of outline, we'll start with talking about Merton's own journey and his idea of the whole person. And then we'll look at our more broadly at our educational journeys as whole person, both the inward and the outward dimensions, and as well the learning capacities that we have as whole persons that are important to culture. And then in our culture, there are cross currents that we have to navigate in this journey to some extent that militate against, against the, uh, develop, our development as whole persons. So we'll spend a little time talking about that and conclude with a note about our human vocation what we're ultimately aiming towards, at least as I understand it from Merman. Now, geographically speaking, Merman was born in France. That's where his journey began. He had some early schooling in France, and then he moved to England. In England, he was orphaned. He was also a brilliant student. He attended Cambridge University, but only for a time. He had some personal missteps there, and ultimately, he moved to Long Island to live with his grandparents and attended Columbia University. Columbia was transformative for her, intellectually speaking. He entered the school with a sense of alienation as someone in the post-World War I world. Um, he was searching for some meaning in his life, something which he could, through which he could ground the meaning of his life and the purpose of his life. He flirted briefly with communism while, while at Columbia and then discovered through a professor named Dan Walsh, St. Thomas Aquinas, and medieval philosophy. He delved deeply into literature with a professor named Mark Van Doren. And then, through a Hindu friend, a learned man named Ramakari, he actually encountered St. Augustine. And this gave him a sense that there is a way to orient your life more deeply. He was baptized Catholic in 1938 and finished his master's degree in literature. English literature at Columbia and began teaching at Bonaventure University. But he wasn't satisfied with just an intellectual training. Merton began to think about the, the spiritual life and how he could immerse himself more deeply in the spiritual life. His general writing becomes more meditative and contemplative, and at some point he feels overwhelmed with the desire of dedicating his life to God. So he's compelled to enter the Baptist order of monks at Gethsemane Abbey, which is a monastery just south of Louisville, Kentucky. And in entering Gethsemane, he feels he's entered the four walls of his new freedom. He feels that he's at the real center of the world. This is where reality is. It's not out in the outer world. He's left that behind. It's gone. He's only 27 years old. And then Merton enters slowly in what I would say is the personal and communal stage of his journey. He becomes a prolific writer on spiritual themes while in the monastery. His autobiography, The Seven Story Mountain, becomes a bestseller in 1948. And at the same time, he becomes a teacher and a spiritual guide for his brother monks. And it's in this latter role that Merton actually begun, has, has an intimate look at the inner journeys of others and begins to, begins to see anew the commonality of our journey, the commonality of our community. And that really moves him. Slowly over time, as, as the 50s get to the 60s, the four walls of the monastery of Merton dissolve. His inner journey, what he thought was a journey of solitude, ironically becomes a journey of connection, conversation, compassion, and relatedness. He radically reconnects with the world in the 1960s in an astonishingly wide, deep correspondence with literary figures, with uh, religious figures, social activists, and young people. He begins to stand with others for peace and write, write prolifically about it. He becomes a beacon for peace activists in the 60s. He also stands for social and economic justice and becomes an important figure in the religious dialogue and cross-cultural dialogue. It's not surprising that the Pope in his recent address to Congress, singled out Merton as a man of dialogue, as an exemplar in that sense. Uh, before he died in 1968, Merton had a rare trip outside the monastery, and actually, as part of his interreligious dialogue, had a meeting with the Dalai Lama. 
So Vernon said that there's something in the depth of our being that hungers for wholeness. Certainly he experienced that too. But what did he mean by that? The whole person for Vernon is not an object of interest in the world. Nor is it about what we do. It's not about some sign of ourselves that goes out into the world. He says rather that the whole person, whole person is our inmost sentiment, our mature personal identity, the self that is found after other partial and exterior selves have been discarded as masks. So for Merman, the whole person is a matter of experience and growing awareness of our own being. And, and it's our ordinary selves, it's our real selves, and what Merton would say is the love that is at the core of all of us. So this point, that the love that is all that is at the core of all of us, of all of us, suggests that love unites us all. The person, Merton says, is one in the unity of love. So in some sense, realizing who we are as all persons, it also connects us and, and helps us discover our relatedness to others our common humanity. It's a glorious destiny, Merton says, to be a member of the human race. People are all walking around, shining like the sun. So this process of becoming whole person, of being, as Merton once put it, what we are, what does it entail? Well, first of all, importantly, there's a normal development of our social, cultural, and psychological sense. And it's important that we develop a healthy sense of identity. And certainly not, and certainly that we're not subjected by contrary social ideas that might define us as less than or more than, or might in some way create a negative view of ourselves. So that, that's the foundation, that's foundation. At the same time, Merton would say that we need to become aware of this inner self, or what he would call the deeper self or true self. And as I mentioned, this is mainly a process of growing an awareness of and response to the love that is at the core of us. So in this process over time, we interact with others. And Merton says paradoxically, it's in this interaction with others that we also find ourselves. Because in this interaction, we find something about our common humanity. And then, over time, Merton suggests that we become more integrated, more whole, and more related. We're able to relate not only within and between social and cultural boundaries, but actually across them on a deeper human level. And we become more free over time to act from our inner integrity and the love and the depths of our being. So what are the learning, our learning capacities our learning capacities as whole persons that are important to cultivate. Burns says we need to save God's liberty and integrity of the human person. So that's where, where we start. We need to learn to think, act, and experience our inner integrity. And that doesn't happen, especially in schools, if no one gives us an opportunity to allow them to think for ourselves and form our own thought attentively, honestly, and deeply. So that's probably the experience that we need. And that will help us learn to speak authentically and to communicate and not simply inform. We live in an information-rich world where we don't necessarily communicate well. For communication, at least in its root sense, means making something common. Communication in its root sense means sharing so as to form community. So that quality of communication is what we're driving, is driving to foster in, in education. That means creating classrooms and places where we learn to speak authentically, learn to support the integrity of others, learn to participate in and form community through genuine communication. So also, our learning capacities as whole persons involve multiple ways of knowing. We're most familiar, especially in our formal schooling, with the idea that we need to know rationally, we need to develop intellectually. And, and to be sure, that's an important part of our growth. We need to learn to think with integrity and care. To some extent, the academic disciplines help us do that. They are disciplines of the mind after all, and they help us to, to think carefully. But by and large, in our academic learning, we're, we're taught to know about things and to explain them. We're not necessarily taught to relate to them or to understand them in their totality. And, 
Murray suggests that there are also intuitive, experiential, and contemplative forms of knowing that are important, that are important to our full development. It's only through intuition that we can actually have the sense of our whole selves. But we can't think it because thinking is part of who we are as whole person. So we need to do that intuitively. And there are forms of, of uh, knowing that we have that allow us to do that poetry, art, music, photography, and dance, and that activate our power of attention, our power of wonder and imagination. You see a picture here of a photograph of Merton with a camera. He was he became enamored with photography in the 60s when he was given a camera by John Howard Griffin, who you may know as a, as a writer, as well as a photographer. And he took what, what some people consider to be contemplative photographs. You'll see some of them in the remaining slides. Finally, of course, there's another way of knowing that's important, and that's the knowledge that comes from love, and that can only come from love. Blaise Pascal, the uh, mathematician, famously said in the 17th century, the heart has reason that only reason can know. And so knowing by love and learning the knowledge of love is also important for our development of all persons. Now, back to the theme of finding ourselves in and through others. It's important that our study, that we study as if we matter, as if people matter. That sounds obvious in certain senses, but it's not always easy. It's important to link ideas to study the people. Focus not simply on what, but on who. Not simply on ideology, but also on people. When we focus exclusively on ideology, as we know, we can get into trouble and start to think exclusively. But that's not helpful to us. So this means learning to attune the human experience in whatever context of study that we have, to ask how are humans affected, or what are people experiencing in this, or where, is, where are these ideas coming from? From people it's important to combine our learning for cultural understanding, our own and others, with exploration of the human experience between and across cultures. So we begin to think on an experiential level, a human experiential level, because that's a, that's a way of connection across boundaries. So it's important to learn not only to identify apart from, Bern would say, not only apart from others but also to identify with others, for that's the foundation of empathy, compassion, and community. And also to learn to dialogue from a position of respect for difference, but also from a sense of relatedness. Respectful point of view, but also in an effort to identify and respond to our deeper humanity and human experience. Merton says we must provide an education that strengthens us against the noise, the violence, the half-truths of our materialistic society. So that means learning to think of truth in human terms, learning to distinguish truth from false persons from the labels about them, reality from the slogans and declarations and rhetoric trying to convince us of something else, especially in our media-saturated world, and sad to say, especially in our political world. It also means learning to explore and cover connections to the natural world as if we are part of that world, as Merton says we are, not apart from it. We don't, don't, we don't possess the world, neither do we stand over against it. And finally, learning community. Community is curriculum in our education, and learning commitment to work which is moved by relatedness, love, justice, care, and wisdom. So what are some of the things in our culture that inhibit this kind of learning. First, we might identify the press for results, for outcomes, products, measurables, and signs of progress, by signs of progress. In the world of education, this is common discourse. This is what we hear often. But Merton says, do not depend on the hope for results. Gradually, you struggle less and less with an idea and more and more with specific people. In the end, it's the reality of personal relationships that saves everything. Now, the context of this remark was a letter to James Forrest, then a young peace activist in the 1960s, who was discouraged by the slow progress of the peace movement. So Merton was trying to give him perspective. But the point is well taken. We need to be wary of substituting results for people, substituting what we want to gain for what is happening now. 
by confusing means and ends. You see there a picture of Murphy with Dan Berrigan, who was one of the peace activists, that turned to him for guidance. He held a retreat for peace activists um, at the end. Berrigan says we have, and we all feel this, a need for self-affirmation. It's a powerful drive within us. And it's accentuated in our society. It's an omnipresent appeal to what we're going to call the external self. Be a success, do this. This is how you this is what you should do. And we have there's a tendency in our culture to objectify your problem. And those are things that we need to consider in our own development. Burnham says, I remove myself as an object of interest in the world. I'm not trying to be something defined by somebody else. And I do that so that I can be everywhere hidden in hiddenness and compassion. There's also the Western tendency to think in duality. Right? We're accustomed, rather than moments, we're, we're accustomed to defining ourselves in parts, our mind, our emotions, talking about ourselves, or to define ourselves over against others or over against the world. This dualistic thinking militates uh, against our understanding of moments. The Bernie says the happy, the, the, there's happiness to being one with everything and the hidden ground of love for which there is no explanation. It's not something that we, we intellectualize. It's something that we experience. That photograph is that we meant to capture a moment of influence. And finally, there's the will to power and control in our society that vies with our need for connection and community. Bird says the world we live in has become called the void, reflecting outwardly the end and blindness in the hearts of men who have grown crazy with their love of money and power and with pride in their technology. Burton asks, what do we live for and who do we stand for? He says, I'm saying no to all the racial injustices, the economic tyrannies. They also say yes to all that is good in the world and in humans. They say yes to all that is beautiful in nature. They must refuse to possess anything in the world that's purely my own. I say yes to all the men and women who are my brothers and sisters in the world. So where does this leave us? Our real journey in life, Bernie says, is interior. It is a matter of growth, deepening, and of an even greater surrender to the creative action of love in our hearts. So our human vocation to conclude, at least as I understand it from Bernie, is to learn to act in ever freedom, greater freedom and love. So I ask to make the contribution that we alone, that's our particular contribution to make, can make to the development of a loving, just, and creative community.